Eating is a routine, so we develop automatic subconscious habits that guide our day-to-day -day decisions without us even realizing it. So today we're going to take a look at eight bad food habits that keep us unhealthy. Before I realized these bad habits, I was getting to my mid-30s, I felt tired, my waistline was expanding, and my blood work was slowly getting worse with every passing year. When I realized what I was doing and replaced my bad food habits with good food habits, my health changed dramatically. I'm going to be 44 in two months, and I feel as healthy as I did in my 20s. I work out with guys half my age, and we're toe-to-toe. -to -toe. My blood work is better than it was 10 years ago, and I don't remember the last time I was sick. <coughs> Just kidding. Now, you're probably thinking, it takes a lot of time to eat healthy and I have a busy life and it's a sacrifice. You can never eat anything you like. The truth is, I spend less time cooking now than I did 10 years ago and I enjoy my food way more because I have good habits in place and I kick the bad habits to the curb. Bad food habit number one is relying on willpower. We've all made New Year's resolutions to finally get in shape. Then some time goes by, we're busy, we're tired, and we go back to old habits. In fact, most people make the same New Year's resolution every year. The problem is we put pressure on ourselves to change, but we don't set up the conditions to succeed. People who are great at improving their health understand that success is less about willpower and more about skill power. They know how to structure their lives so that the healthiest option is also the easiest option. If your choice of food is made in front of the vending machine, at the time when you're hungry and in a rush to go back to work, you've already relinquished 90% of the control you had over the situation. But if every Sunday you pack a healthy snack into five Ziploc bags and every day you take one with you to work, now it's Tuesday afternoon, you're hungry, you have a choice. You can walk down three flights of stairs and go spend money to eat something unhealthy, or you can just reach into your bag and have something great for free. Now you have a much better chance of succeeding because you've stacked the deck in your favor. I just read The Willpower Instinct by a Stanford psychologist, and she explains that great willpower is not about fighting your instincts. It's about harnessing them. Have you noticed that when we're tired or hungry, we make worse choices? That's because willpower is energy intensive. It burns fuel. So if we just keep using it, sooner or later, we run out. This has been shown in many fascinating studies. If you ask smokers to control the urge to smoke, they're more likely to binge on ice cream. And people on a diet are more likely to cheat. On their partner, not just the diet. We can make our willpower battles easier by using leverage. For example, making a bad choice slightly harder can make a big difference. If the candy is in plain sight at arm's reach, you have to make a conscious choice not to eat it. Not easy. Try moving it to a high shelf that requires you to get on a stool, or put it in the back of the pantry. Now it requires a conscious decision to eat it, and leave the healthy snacks at arm's length instead. You've just stacked the deck in your favor and raised your chances of success. Imagine if at dinner time we put a salad and a chocolate cake in front of our kids and then put pressure on them to make the right choice. That won't go over well. So we create the conditions around them that help them choose the best option. Not because we want to control their lives, but because we want what's best for them. So why do we treat ourselves differently? Put less pressure on yourself to make the right choice in the wrong situation and start building the context around you that helps you succeed. I don't like to drive, so I join gyms within walking distance, which makes it easier for me to go and forces me to walk back and forth. Win-win. I've set the conditions to succeed, so I find it very doable to exercise every day and stay healthy even during the quarantine. Why put on the quarantine 15 when you can get quarantine lean. Now, ideally, you want to personalize this for your situation. As the book explains, self-control is rooted in self-knowledge. So share below what strategies work for you to overcome hurdles and get healthier. Start building your skill power and structuring your life so that the right choices are already made for you. Bad food habit number two is fear of standing out. We all want to fit in, and eating is a social and cultural event. If you eat healthy as a Westerner, you stand out. If you're at normal body weight as an American, you stand out. Over 70% of Americans are now overweight or obese. If you want to get to your 40s and 50s and be lean and active and have good cholesterol and good glucose levels, you're going to stand out because that's not the norm. If you want to have a good financial life, a good family life, to be emotionally balanced, to learn a new skill, everything in life that's worth a damn requires you to stand out. Standing out for a positive reason is a good thing. That's what outstanding means. It's somebody who's doing a great job. So don't avoid it. Get used to it. It's normal for people to notice your change of habit and ask questions. So don't be scared of being in that position. 
just naturally say, yeah, I'm making some changes. Don't hide it, don't flaunt it, don't lecture, and don't try to convert everybody else. Criticism is often a form of defensiveness. Most people are incredibly tolerant of our choices and preferences as long as they feel it doesn't encroach on theirs. In fact, most people will respect you for making a positive change, and many will even try to emulate you. Success leaves clues, and when you start to feel better and look better, people are sure to notice. My personal experience has been nothing but positive whenever I made lifestyle changes. Everybody around me, friends, family, coworkers, were always supportive and encouraging, and in fact, many felt motivated to make similar choices. But I do hear stories, including from some of you, of facing some criticism and intolerance. If your friends have a problem with you getting healthier, they were not your friends in the first place. This is an unpopular thing to say, but sometimes overhauling your life requires overhauling the company you keep. If we allow peer pressure and mockery to influence our decisions, we're basically putting our health in the hands of the most close-minded people around us. If someone makes a passing comment or a joke, don't be defensive, just laugh along and joke back. Most people are comfortable with your choices if they feel that you are. But if it's persistent or malicious, like bullying, then that's not someone you want to be spending your time with. The people we surround ourselves with can drag us up or drag us down. So if you feel pulled in the wrong direction, it might be time to find a new crew. Okay, what if it's family? We can't just cut family ties like we can bad friendships. Lots of people tell me, oh, it's my culture, we just eat a lot. I get it. I'm half Portuguese and half Brazilian. My people like to eat. The principle is the same. It's normal for a family member to notice your change of habit and ask. But it's not acceptable to consistently try to change your mind or boycott your decision. You just have to clearly communicate, not in an angry or aggressive tone, but just make it clear that this is your decision. And they don't have to change their choices, but they do have to accept and respect yours. Okay, what if you live with someone with very different habits? I have friends and family members and viewers who are in this position. They avoid eating a lot of sugar or meat or whatever it may be, but their significant other has very different choices. All the couples that are successful have found ways to live with each other's differences. They make meals that are 80% the same, but then have some meat on the side for one person but not the other, or they keep their foods in different areas. They have organized their lives so as to not pressure or sabotage each other. In some ways, it even strengthens your habit, because if you live around the food and you still don't eat it, I mean, now you can go anywhere. Nothing tempts you anymore. It's true that change is easier if you're not alone, but you want to find a journey partner that's already motivated, not someone you have to drag along kicking and screaming. That's only going to make it harder, because now you got to carry your own weight, and somebody else's. I know this can be tricky, but with some organizing and some negotiating, and as long as people are reasonable and the relationships are healthy in the first place, it can be done. The third habit to kick to the curb is shopping for the advice we want to hear. This one's big. We all do this in different degrees. I see people with high cholesterol buying into advice that cholesterol doesn't matter, or that body weight is all genetics, so there's nothing we can do about it. Sometimes we just want to get some peace of mind. There's so much pressure on us to be perfect at everything, and there's not enough time. So it's very tempting to believe that my issue isn't really an issue, or there's nothing I can do about it, so why bother? The truth is, most of these common health concerns, losing a little bit of weight, uh, lowering cholesterol, lowering glucose, they are doable. With some tweaks to our lifestyle and some patience, most of us can achieve them. Meaningful change rarely happens overnight, and it usually does require us to go a bit outside our comfort zone. But it's not as hard as it seems at first, and once we're past that initial stage of doubt and having to take action, and we start to see some results, it always feels amazing and totally worth it. The internet has this effect of normalizing everything. A generation ago, if I thought the Earth was flat, I was just crazy. But now, I'm part of a community. You can find people online to validate and encourage any opinion, no matter how divorced from reality. In science, we have to be skeptical with results we don't like, and more skeptical with results we like. And the internet is kind of similar. If my hobby is researching some conspiracy theory or reading some shady blogs, I mean, who cares, right? Maybe I'm wasting time, no big deal. But if it's my health I'm researching, and I can't separate rabbit holes from reliable scientific sources, that's going to have a real impact on my life. It's okay to read blogs and popular books, but realize these are not peer-reviewed. A book gives an illusion of scholarship and authority, but there's no quality control for scientific accuracy in popular books. You can write pretty much whatever you want. The same is true for almost everything on the internet. And yes, this applies to YouTube videos. People message me and say, I used to follow guru such and such, 
but then I watched your video, I realized he was wrong, and now I only trust you. That is incredibly flattering and humbling, but I don't want to be the next guru. Ideally, we want to share the tools for scientific critical thinking so that you don't need any gurus anymore. There are tons of nutrition ideas floating online, and many are misunderstandings. If you can't find scientists in that specific field or established health organizations who agree, be suspicious. Getting second opinions and third opinions is a great move. But in health, we gotta be careful to not just go with the opinion we like. Bad food habit number four is the one-size-fits-all diet. We don't all look good in the same clothes, or are interested in the same careers, or have the same hobbies. So why shouldn't our health goals be personalized too? We put all our energy on achieving our goals, and none on choosing them. We decide to eat diet XYZ because we see it on a magazine cover, or online, or a friend did it. Then we can't stick with it, and we feel like a failure. But maybe the only mistake was the choice of goal. Maybe it wasn't right for me. Now, individual variation is often used as an excuse to ignore science and just do and eat whatever we want. So that's not what I'm saying. There are basic principles that apply to everybody. Smoking isn't healthy for anyone, and neither is a diet packed with ultra-processed foods, added salt and sugar, and saturated fat. But there is a lot of wiggle room to tailor things to us. If your eating plan is so strict it requires you to cheat, maybe you're going too far too fast. Try integrating it into the plan. Once a week, I'm going to eat something sweet. It's not a failure anymore. So that takes away that aura of forbidden fruit and maybe even makes it less tempting. Once it's on the schedule, you might actually forget to do it. Isn't it ironic that one of the main obstacles when trying to fix our eating habits is biting off more than we can chew. The perfect is the enemy of the good. We set overly ambitious goals because it's more exciting. Who wants to lose three pounds in a month? Boring. We want to lose 30 or 40 or overhaul our entire diet overnight. But you know what's really exciting? Seeing progress, feeling like we're accomplishing something. This yo-yo of losing weight and putting it back on is destructive for the body and the mind. It keeps telling us that we can't do it. We work so hard and we're right back to where we started. So, kick the habit of choosing goals made by and for other people. Aim for things that make sense for your life and that you can live with. As you tackle small goals, your confidence will grow and you will be gradually able to tackle bigger ones. And it will become almost addictive. Okay, four habits down, we're halfway there. Bad food habit number five is identifying with your habit. We say things like, I want to get fit, but I just don't like to exercise. I want to eat healthy, but I just like junk food too much. We treat our inclinations like they're unchangeable attributes of our personality, like they define us. But our preferences are just habits we built. My taste has completely changed over the years. I crave things like lentil soup or steamed broccoli. And things I grew up eating regularly, like chocolate or ice cream, never crossed my mind. I'm not saying those things are bad and we should never touch them. My point is, our preferences change. They are shaped by our choices. The biggest obstacles in life are self-imposed. Imagine convincing ourselves that we're irreversibly programmed to do things that are bad for us. And yet, this is how we talk. When you slowly build a habit of eating foods that revitalize and strengthen you, your body and your mind get used to it and start pushing you in that direction. It's like finding the cheat codes. There are many ways to introduce more health-promoting foods into your diet, from slowly ramping onto them so you get used to it, to mixing them with your old foods, to playing with different cooking and seasoning styles to make them more appealing, etc. But that's the easy part. We can all figure that out once we realize that our preferences are not set in stone. Bad food habit number six is confusing. Simple with easy. Eating healthy is simple, but it's not easy. Those are two very different things. It's not easy because in our society, suboptimal choices are shoved in our faces 24 seven. But it is very simple. Fresh fruits and vegetables, easy on the ultra-processed foods. That's 90% of nutrition. We all know it, and we've known it long before we had all the fancy studies. Yes, there are lots of pathways and molecules and genes, and learning is phenomenal, but don't let the details distract you from the big picture. You already know how to eat healthy. Lots of people try to complicate things because you can't sell something that people already know. So countless books and courses and headlines try to convince us that everything we thought we knew about food is wrong, and some recent finding turned all of science upside down overnight. Nope, it didn't. And a part of us wants to believe that it's not that simple, that there's a trick or some secret that we don't know yet. So we keep falling for headlines and fad diets and running around in circles 
even though we already have everything we need to succeed right in front of us. Eating healthy can be hard, but it's not complicated. It takes a little bit of organization, but when we focus on the key principles, that's when we see results. Six down, two to go. Bad food habit number seven is obsession with the short term. We all wanna look good for the summer or fit into the clothes for the upcoming wedding. But think back, how important was looking good for that party 10 years ago? You don't even remember it. But the habits you were building back then, good or bad, chances are they're still with you. Long-term health is our biggest asset. Losing weight is a good thing but it's only one component of health. Every healthy dietary pattern will help you move towards and maintain a healthy body weight. But not every diet that helps with weight loss is healthy. I'm gonna say that again. Every healthy diet helps with weight, but not every diet that helps with weight is healthy. So shoot for the full package, not the shiny box with nothing inside. And what goes for weight loss goes for the obsession with big muscles and six pack abs. Being fit is great. We've talked about working out but I see people every day throwing their health out the window for the promise of bigger muscles or being shredded. The internet is packed with theories that you've got to load up on saturated fat or cut back on fiber-rich foods to get buff and lean. None of that is true. You can get fit and build muscle on a health-promoting diet with adequate protein intake and the right physical activity. You don't need to compromise your long-term health for short-term results. So don't settle. And the last bad food habit is minimizing the impact of food habits. Warren Buffett has a great quote. The chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken. I think it's never too late to break them. But he's right that the longer we wait, the harder it gets. I don't think it's a coincidence that Warren Buffett has a great quote that applies to health. Because building a healthy lifestyle is just like investing. Once you set it in motion, it keeps compounding over the years until it gets to this life-changing dimension that you can't believe started with something so small. In the beginning, you have to do the pushing, but once it picks up speed, it pushes you and eventually carries you forward. So the trick is to start as early as you can, and you don't even need some grand New Year's resolution like losing 100 pounds or getting a 12 pack. A small, realistic, and sustainable step is all it takes. For more practical tips, here are ways to save money while eating healthy, and here are seven things about food I wish I knew long ago. I'll see you there.